my name's Jane, and I've been working at DFID um, for quite a few years now, since about 1995, as a forester and then latterly as a livelihoods advisor. But over the period um, that we've been talking about this morning, I had a very close relationship with a lot of the sustainable livelihoods community of practice. And for um, a few years, I led what was called the Sustainable Livelihoods Support Office, which was the office in DFID that worked to support and work with other organizations who wanted to carry forward and explore sustainable livelihoods. In thinking about today, <coughs> I wanted to try to capture some of the voices of people in DFID who've been working in sustainable livelihoods through all its ups and downs. So Diana Carney, who many of you will know, who produced a lot of documents and um, guidance notes and, and books around sustainable livelihoods with the wider community. We just revisited and talked to a lot of the people who were instrumental in DFID, because we were asked to do a, a DFID view during the really busy times of sustainable livelihoods. And for those of you who've logged on and had a chance to read, we just documented it in a light paper, which is kind of basically in three chunks. The, the energy and drive and commitment in the late 90s for the natural sciences group in DFID, sustainable livelihoods resonated very, very strongly with the rural natural resource advisors. There was a very strong pull from that group and a realization through all the research and work that we were doing with sustainable farmers, farming systems research, etc., <coughs> that none of these rural issues that we were looking at fell into sectoral boxes. So when the broader language started to develop about access to resources, about different kinds of resources, about livelihoods, there was a very strong attraction into that, into that group. So foresters had been doing a lot of work on, on trees, but the kind of opportunity through community forestry projects and working on <coughs> community projects to see that it wasn't just about trees, it was about people who needed to use those trees in order to get a livelihood, and then the thinking broad, broadened out from that. So there was a group there who were kind of really ready for these new ideas. And when people came along with not necessarily the sustainable livelihoods framework, but a framework, a conversation where they could frame these ideas and feel where they fitted in. This, however, as the paper goes on, I said it was in kind of three bits. So there's a bit about the energy and the adoption. Then there's a bit that the paper probably dwells on quite a bit because this is, this is the moment where we can all kind of be counselled and lie on the couch and reflect. But there was a moment when sustainable livelihoods then went into... I'm not too sure, demise is a strong word, but it went, it kind of fell away, certainly at the centre of DFID. And there's a lot of ideas as to why that might be, and I'm happy to explore those. But then the third section of the paper is much more optimistic. So although sustainable livelihoods approaches as a dialogue might have fallen away at the centre uh, of DFID, whereas Ian was saying this morning, the economists are very, very powerful, where the governance agenda is very, very powerful. And as well, at the time of SL's demise, what was also incredibly powerful in DFID, and probably the most powerful factor, was that DFID was changing from being the overseas development agency into being the Department for International Development with a Secretary of State and a, a very, very strong need for DFID to be seen across Whitehall as a government department. And that was quite a strong organizational change for DFID, which is probably slightly hidden to a lot of people on the outside. At the end of this review, reflecting the views of my colleagues who are named in the back of the paper, there's a very strong feeling at the moment that with the issues that we were talking about this, mo this morning, the, the rise of climate change, the need to think about climate change adaption, the need to think about vulnerabilities, the need to think about resilience in the, <clears throat> in the face of food, fuel crises, financial crises, 
that actually the language and thought process behind sustainable livelihoods is beginning to come back into the dialogues. And I would say it would be far too optimistic for me to say that it was coming back into the headquarters dialogues, but certainly at a country level 